Um, in December, the portfolio team for business credit had its uh, annual meeting, and one of the things we did was we brought in a gentleman who was a former client of Legacy Wells Fargo to talk about the relationship and how important it was at the decision-making level. Uh, Lenny and I have been friends for years, and um, his, he's a terrible golfer. Let's start there. Agreed. 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 But Lenny has been a great, great friend of Wells Fargo, and he's been kind enough to speak with us in December. He's kind enough to fly out here to talk to all of us about what really matters, in his opinion, when having a relationship with his bank at the CEO level. I cannot do justice to the history and the background that he has, so he'll tell you what I will say is for you people who like rock music, this is the guy you want to know. <laughs> so with that, Lenny. Thank you, Monica. Can everybody hear me? Uh, again, my name is Lenny Schutzberg, and I am CEO of America Manufacturing Company. We are a non-woven textile manufacturer, which meant nothing to me when I heard the term, so I will tell you that we make a variety of products, but the product you would probably most be familiar with is a ubiquitous cleaning device in the janitorial cleaning supply industry. It is a circular disc that goes under a floor cleaning machine, and it strips, polishes, burnishes a floor. We are the second largest manufacturer of that device in the world. Before I get started, though, talking to you about what it takes to bank an entrepreneur, I thought I would kind of give you a brief background in my, uh, of my history and tell you about my circuitous route to entrepreneurship. I graduated from The Ohio State University with degrees in accounting and computer science, and I moved to Dallas, Texas, where I took a job with Touche Ross. That was one of the big eight accounting firms at the time. I lasted about four months when, much to the chagrin of my family, I quit my job. I realized that I wasn't cut out to be a CPA. Now, mind you, I passed the exam, and I know accounting, so I can certainly do the job, but I wanted to be an entrepreneur, and I wanted to run my own company, and I didn't see this was the right pathway for me to get there. So I packed up my bags, and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and I met my cousin who moved the same week from Los Angeles, and together we opened up an entertainment consulting company. We were gonna manage rock bands and promote concerts. My first client was a band by the name of Kansas. I don't know if some of you may remember them in the 1970s. At one time, they were the biggest band in the world. About a month after I got to Atlanta, I went on the road with ZZ Top, and I spent the next seven years traveling with the biggest rock bands in the world. I've toured with Van Halen and Journey, ACDC, Aerosmith, Brian Adams, Bon Jovi, Garth Brooks. If they were playing music on the radio in the 1980s, there was a very good chance that during my career I had some interaction with that band. I'd still be in the business today if I hadn't met my wife. But through some volunteer work that I was doing in Atlanta, I met Mary Ann, and shortly thereafter, I had an epiphany. If I stayed in the rock and roll business, I was probably never going to be married, never have children, have a lot of money, and be very unhappy. So, for the second time in my career, I surprised all friends and family by quitting my job. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I wanted to close this deal with Mary Ann, which I'm happy to report I did, the biggest deal I've made in my lifetime. And I said, how do I get to where I want to be? I want to be an entrepreneur. So to get there, i got to take you back to a seemingly innocuous decision that I made when I was in high school. In ninth grade, I joined Junior Achievement. Show of hands, anybody familiar with Junior Achievement? A lot of you. Those that aren't familiar with Junior Achievement, it's a 90-year-old nonprofit global organization that teaches high school kids about entrepreneurship and the free enterprise system. And through an experiential learning process, kids start and run their own companies. So in ninth grade, we started a business, and we elected officers, and we sold stock in the company, and we decided to produce a product and sell the product. After four or five months, we liquidated the company, and we returned a dividend to our shareholders. I did that four times in high school, and I was hooked. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to run a business. Somewhere along the way, I came to the realization that while the medical, the legal, the accounting professions, these are all noble pursuits, it was very difficult 
to leverage that business. If you were a surgeon, you made money when you were operating. And if you were an accountant or a lawyer, you had to bill somebody to make a living. But I could theoretically fly across the country and spend a day with some bankers, and I was still going to make some money. So I knew that I wanted to make something. I just didn't know how. So I started interviewing with manufacturing firms, and I took a job with a small manufacturing company, took a risk on me, and I started cutting my teeth on standard costing and bills of materials, variance, labor absorption, all, all new concepts to me, and over the next decade, I actually became an expert in manufacturing. I was running a small business for another family, reasonably happy, but still not where I wanted to be, when I got a phone call from my father-in-law in December of 1999. He had started America 44 years ago this year, and the business was struggling. And he wanted me to come out there and help him turn this business around. Everything that I knew told me, don't do this. This is stupid. This is a family business, your family business. And one of two things is going to happen. It can go really well, or it can go really bad. And I already knew this was really bad, so don't do this. But for the third time in my career, I quit my job, and I moved out there in February of 2000. In the first week, I was sick to my stomach. This business was much worse than he had represented, or than he even knew. This was a business beyond repair. We were $5 million in debt through a lender of last resort who, by acquisition or attrition, I may see some familiar faces here. This was Congress Financial. A tumultuous time for the company. And they cut us off. They weren't lending us any more money. The building was dilapidated. The equipment was archaic. This was not a business that we were going to turn around. And I must tell you, if I knew how bad this business was when I went there, I never would have gone. They say ignorance is bliss. I never would have imagined that in 13 years, my brother-in-laws and I could do what we did. 2013, this $10 million company will do close to $50 million in sales. We've acquired six companies in the last six years, and we are having the time of our lives. I can't tell you how it happened. There was a lot of serendipity along the way, but it's a very exciting time. I'm very fulfilled having achieved my life's ambition to run a family business, my own. And I wanted to share with you a little history or a little view of the thought process I have in what it takes to bank an entrepreneur. Before I get started, I will tell you that there's no rhyme or reason. These are just my views. They're not in any particular order of importance. And interestingly enough, some of these principles actually transcend banking relationships, and they deal with business relationships in general. So the first thing that I would like to tell you is that banking, as you know, is a commodity. You may not like to hear that, but the services that you provide, businesses like mine, are perfunctory in nature. We know what they are before you walk in. We know what you do. So in order to convince somebody to do banking with Wells Fargo, you have to convince them what are your competitive advantages, what are your differences. I'm in a commoditized business as well. Floor pads is a commodity. And most people are focused on price. Floor pads is actually a shrinking business. It's a declining business. With tumultuous economies around the world, people clean floors less. But in the last five years, our business has grown double digit every year. So we're gaining market share by touting our competitive advantages. So Wells Fargo needs to communicate to banker or to entrepreneurs like me. What's the difference between doing business with Wells Fargo and doing business with any other tier one bank? And that difference is both in the bank and the banker. And I will tell you, I make decisions primarily based on the banker. I know that when you come in and you want to do business with me, you can do the same thing that every other bank does. So a lot of it has to do with the relationship I develop with you. So the first thing that I would advise you to do is get to know me. Get to know what my passions are. What is my interest? As Monica said, I love to golf. I'm terrible at it. But I actually enjoy the game. I make money on the golf course. One of the products that we produce is an underlayment for a golf course sand trap. It's an erosion inhibitor that goes between the dirt and the sand. And we have a 75% market share globally in that business. Our products are in Augusta National, St. Andrews. They're in Tigers courses in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. We do it all over the world. And when you start talking to me about golfing, 
you got me interested. I'm also a Buckeye. I told you I was a Buckeye. I was the mascot of Ohio State. So I'm very passionate about Ohio State football and Ohio State Michigan. You talk to me about the angst in my family as my number two son has just been accepted to the University of Michigan. <laughs> and Saturdays may never be the same in our household, but I would look forward to him going there. Get to know the entrepreneur as much as you get to know their business, and that will give you an opportunity, a segue into their business. Now, speaking of their business and getting to know their business, you will not bank America if you don't understand what we do. If you don't know who our customers are, if you don't know who our suppliers and our supply chain and our challenges, if you know who our competitors are, you will have a much better opportunity banking us than if you just know we make stuff. So getting to know our business is very important. And I've never met an entrepreneur who isn't passionate about what they do. You get me talking about non-woven materials, and I won't stop talking. I'm very passionate about my business. So spend as much time as you can learning about what it is I do, and learning about what my business does, and what my challenges are. And you may have an opportunity to get my business. Sharing examples. This is something that I find most bankers don't do, and I find it very surprising. Sharing examples of ideas that your clients have is a great way to earn my business and my respect. And I'm not talking about banking. I'm not talking about confidential information. I'm not talking about sharing anything that your customers wouldn't want you to share. I had a CPA that walked through my plant 20 years ago, and he asked me if I was a drug-free workplace. And I asked him why he was asking that question. That didn't make any sense to me. I didn't know that to certify an HR person and do some training and fill out some forms would save me 7.5% premium on workers' comp insurance. I spend a quarter million dollars on workers' comp each year. He saved me $20,000. He's my CPA today. Has nothing to do with his ability to do accounting. So as a banker, a lawyer, an accountant, you are in the enviable position of learning about people's businesses and you see what your customers do best. And sharing those ideas, those anecdotes with me, endears you to me. It makes me very interested in the banker. And this is something that banks should do more often. The process of converting a relationship takes time. It's not an overnight process. If you come out and you visit with me and you think I'm going to sign up with you immediately, you're probably in the wrong business. Banking relationships can take years to cultivate. And it's not something that you should feel bad about if after spending two or three or seven years with a prospect, you've yet to do a transaction with them. Because you have an opportunity to make money through that relationship, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But a banking relationship takes time to develop. I'm not looking for banking relationships, but things change over time. Banks change. Monica mentioned I'm not a client today. It has nothing to do with Monica. The best relationship I've ever had in banking is with Monica. But my needs changed, and they changed, unfortunately, at the time that Wells Fargo was acquiring Wachovia. And Monica, Wachovia was unable to cater to my needs. So a banker that I met years ago, who had kept in touch with me and talked with me, I gave him a call and said, that call that you were expecting, today might be the day. Let's see if we can make something happen. I did it grudgingly, because I didn't want to leave Wachovia. But they were unable to fulfill my needs at the time. So relationships take time to develop, and it's important that you not look for the quick sale. Uh, we have a saying in our business to make a customer, not a sale, and that's very important to us. <clears throat> Another mistake that some bankers make is not figuring out early on who the stakeholders are and the decision makers are in each business. Every business is different, and there are influence peddlers in the business that could make a difference, and they may not be the decision makers. In America, I make the decision as to which bank to bank with, but I rely on others to give me advice. My brother-in-laws will tell me their views, and if everything is equal, I may look towards the controllers who deal with the bank every day, and I ask them, who do you like? Who do you work with? Uh, this bank has a great technology platform. And by the way, that's one of your competitive advantages, because Wells Fargo, in my opinion, has the best technology platform in the business. You tout those advantages, 
and you have a chance of converting relationships. But understand who the people are in the business that make those decisions that don't just serve or cater to the owner or decision maker. Because it's a group process that makes those decisions in most businesses. Another challenge, if you will, is for us to understand who you are and what you do in your organization. I can meet someone four times, I have your business card, I know your face, and I know your position, and I still don't know what you do. Everybody at Wells Fargo is a vice president, including the receptionist. So it, for me, I, I don't know functionally that an underwriter at Wells Fargo does something different than an underwriter at Bank of America or BB&T. So don't take it for granted that even though we've met you three or four times and we've talked with you, that we necessarily understand what it is you do. When you convert that relationship, I'm very surprised. That I don't think I've ever received a single repository, a communication document that says, here's your entire team. Here's their face. Here's their contact information. If you need treasury services, Sandy's the person to call. If you, need, if you have a problem with the deposit, John is the person you want to speak to. I'll be your relationship manager. And there's a whole team of people. We do this in America. We do business in 70 different countries, and when I sign up a new customer, the first thing they get is a Word document that introduces them to their team at America. And if they want to know how to ship a product, if they want to know how to get additional credit, they know exactly who to call, and they can share that information with others in their organization. I don't see that happening very often, and it's very surprising, because it's very intimidating, very confusing to an entrepreneur, to a business person, to do business with a bank and all the people they meet. They don't really understand who it is, what these people do. So just keep that in mind. With respect to the team, I can tell you that banking is a team sport. Okay, I, I make decisions based on bankers, but interestingly enough, I have a great relationship today with my bank, and it's only one person. It's a relationship manager. If he leaves, I will leave the bank. I will call Monica immediately. I don't have any relationship with anybody else at the bank. With Wachovia, I had a team relationship. I had bench strength. Monica was my first point of contact. Valerie Bailey was excellent. And I had other people in her organization that I could call. And that bench strength, that team environment, makes a difference to a company like me. So while it's important to develop and foster these relationships personally, I would encourage you to bring people out with you. I would encourage you, if you're a green banker, that doesn't mean you recycle. That means that you're new to banking. I'm probably not going to be interested in, in doing a deal with you. But that doesn't mean you won't do a deal with me. Uh, associate yourself with others in your organization who have some depth, who have some experience, and can help you along the way. But don't feel, I had a meeting once with a banker who had been with the bank for three months, and every single thing he said was incorrect. And he was there by himself. He had no chance with me at all. So it's very important to have a strong team that represents you. Being a stranger to your customer will undoubtedly open the door to your competition. I had a relationship with another bank and I didn't see my banker for three years. Now granted, we were making very good money. We were doing very well. This was another business I was running. But I never saw the banker. And I can tell you that even if you're doing well, you should go and visit your clients regularly. You can drive up and you can see if they're cutting their grass, if their fence is repaired. You can tell a lot just by visiting the facility. I travel all over the world and I visit customers and I pass judgment about their wherewithal to do business with me just based on that visual appearance, that engagement, that interaction with that person. You can't do that via email. You can't do that over the phone. So having regular contact with your customer will almost certainly keep that customer <coughs> engaged with you. And it will give you the intelligence that you need to understand if that relationship may be in peril. <clears throat> Speaking of that relationship, if you have to think about whether or not your CEO, CFO, your uh, decision maker at the company is considering another bank, they probably are. If you have to think that, I would make a suggestion to you in treating every relationship like it's in peril at all times. Unlike a marriage where there's implicit continuity and sustainability, a banking relationship is always subject to change. Doesn't mean that 
We're out there looking to change those relationships. Quite frankly, there are huge switching costs. It's a daunting task to change a bank. I don't like doing that. I like running the company, not changing banks. But a banking relationship is always in jeopardy. And if you look at it that way, and you treat it that way, you'll have long, sustained relationships with your customers. As I said, the only reason I'm not with Wachovia Wells Fargo today has nothing to do with my relationship with my banker. How do you find people like me? Well, certainly, introduction is the best way. If somebody can introduce you, um, I, I know a lot of people in my city, and if I, one of those people that I respect, they call me and they say, I want you to meet so-and-so, I want you to meet Monica Cole, she's with Wells Fargo. In deference to my relationship with that person, I will engage her. She can come out and talk to me, and she has an opening. If you don't have that introduction, I can tell you that a feeding ground, a fertile feeding ground, is involvement in charitable organizations and in your community. And when I see banks cutting costs, when I see banks in tumultuous economies say, we can't afford to support this uh, golf tournament, or we can't afford to sustain this organization, I'd say that's probably the stupidest. You should start looking for another job. When the economies are bad, you ought to spend more money on your volunteerism. Not only because it's altruistic, it's the right thing to do, but because that's where opportunities present themselves. And the banker that I do business with today, I met at a golf fundraiser. I met him when I had a great relationship with Wachovia. And I told him right from the get-go, I have a great relationship with Wachovia. But I said, things change. Bankers change. If my banker leaves Wells Fargo or Wachovia, I may leave with her. Keep in touch. And he did. He kept in touch. Once a year, twice a year, he came out. Maybe we play around at golf, have some dinner. He'd see our business. And two or three years later, that, that, that meeting, that chance encounter at a fundraiser paid off for his bank. So don't stop that no matter what happens. That is a, a huge opportunity to meet potential clients. Speaking of networks, entrepreneurs tend to have vast networks. I've been in business in Atlanta for 30 years, and I know lots of accountants and insurance agents. I know lawyers and bankers. And when people call me and they ask me if you know a good banker, I will tell you candidly, the first person I send them to is Monica, not my bank. So even though I'm not doing business with Wells Fargo today, Wells Fargo is making money knowing me. You may never do business with me. You may never consummate a single transaction with me. And you can still make money through me. So it's not about just measuring how much business, how much money I borrow, what my account generates for you. It's the qualitative value in the relationship. And I can tell you that's something worth pursuing. The last point I want to make about a bank is that a bank needs to grow with its customer. And I mentioned the reason why I left Wachovia and Wells Fargo was that we were at a time where we were transitioning from an asset-based lending relationship to a commercial banking relationship. And the bank was in purgatory. They couldn't move. I know they could do it, and they could do it right now. But at the time that I needed a change in services, the bank wasn't there for me. That's the only reason they lost the relationship. So knowing when your customer's needs change and growing with your customer is a great way to keep that account. And I believe I will be back with Wells Fargo one day in the future. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> any, any questions? This is a period of time to ask me questions about my business. Yes? I was just wondering if you could be a little more specific about what you were looking for in the commercial banking side that asset-based lending couldn't uh, offer you. Uh, my deal um, was heavily collateralized. There was more than sufficient uh, security in the relationship. I stopped borrowing money. I was doing too well. I paid off all my debts. I had a million dollars in the bank. And Wells Fargo, Wachovia, couldn't pay me the interest on it. I was just stuck in purgatory. 
So my needs changed. I didn't need the oversight, the monthly oversight. I didn't need the asset-based lending vehicle or platform. I needed a commercial lending platform, and Wachovia was in a position they couldn't do it yet. They couldn't make a change. Monica, you can talk about that. I don't know if there was something behind the scenes I didn't know they were aware of. No, no, you're perfectly correct. We were in the middle of going through bringing the two institutions together, and when Lenny and I talked about it, you know, even at the time there was so much that we could do from a bis business credit perspective, and I showed Lenny, I said, look, we can get you halfway there, but I'll be frank with you, Lenny, you, you deserve better. And at the time, the RCBO was really in flux around what they could do. So Lenny and I sort of reached a gentle man-woman <laughs> to, to, to basically say, listen, you know, why don't you go get the best deal you can get Let's stay in touch, and then when you're actually willing to borrow some money, okay. <laughs> borrow some money. I agree. But let, we'll bring you back. I'm, I'm going to add something to what Monica said because things change. You know, my business is very fluid, and things change overnight. So here I was, I'm not banking with Wells Fargo, and I have an opportunity to acquire my largest competitor. I'm in a commercial banking relationship, and this is going to immediately, overnight, change to an asset-based lending relationship. This was a large transaction, an eight-figure credit facility. I called Monica, and I explained the situation. I was going to this company. It's a public company. And I needed some credibility. I needed to know that um, they were behind me if I wanted to make a deal. In, in less than a week, I had a term sheet from Wells Fargo for an eight-figure uh, eight credit facility as well as a term sheet for my bank, not a tier one bank. And that gave me the credibility that I needed to go to this public company and make a deal. I chose not to do the deal. I actually walked away from the deal, not because the money was wrong, the terms were, were not appropriate, but because I felt that the quality of the assets that I was buying was not worth the money that they were asking. Ironically, on January 27th, 2013, they announced the closure of their facility. The next day, the CEO was in my office, and a week later, an email went to all customers worldwide announcing that Americo is the best choice for your needs going forward. I purchased all of their strategic assets for pennies on the dollar, but Wells Fargo helped me make that deal. That's the second biggest deal I've ever made. And my business will grow 10 to $15 million this year as a result of that closure. Any other questions? Yes? When you, um, I don't need that. <laughs> when, when you receive a, a pitch from a bank, um, a multi-page pitch, where the bankers come in and sit down with a quote-unquote deck, what is your view towards that? I mean, I have my own personal view, which I think is, uh, if you can't tell by the tone of my voice. <laughs> I sense a little disdain, <laughs> a little contempt. I, mean, I, was in a, I was at a pitch, honestly, two weeks ago with a big, large client, and we gave them a 46-page deck in terms of how we wanted to pitch the business. And I was just wondering, from all your experiences in terms of dealings with banks, is that the right way to approach it, or should the message be simplified? Uh, I'll try to answer your question. I may not give you the answer that you want, though. Every business is different. Um, I said it before and I'll say it again. It is a commodity. Your money is the same color as Bank of America's or bb &T. And first and foremost, before anything else, I'm looking at the cost of doing business with you. When I moved from Wachovia to the bank that I now do business with, I saved a quarter million dollars a year in interest and fees. That was significant to me. The 45 other pages are interesting, but at the end of the day, you have to be competitive. Now, I will tell you, we have a saying in our business that a drowning man will cling to an anchor. Our competitors do really stupid things out there to try and survive. And there's nothing that says that you need to capitulate or you need to match the stupidity in the industry. But you need to know what they do, and you need to understand what everybody else is doing. So what I'm looking at, I'm cutting through that 45 pages. It, it, it's of interest to me down the road if I choose to go forward. But I want to know what's the deal going to cost me? And what are the caveats? 
what are the requirements? Um, I went from a relationship where I had all types of conditions to a, a relationship where I have a single covenant. I have one covenant in my deal today. It's a net worth covenant. And my bank is frustrated because I'm not borrowing any money. But I will be borrowing money. I borrowed a million and a half dollars in 2007 to build a $3 million production line. It was a seven-year deal that I paid off in 18 months. And I'm installing a $3 million production line as we speak. It was a $3 million line. I borrowed $1 million just to lock in 3.4% interest over seven years. And I hope to use that money to buy some other companies. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, Any others? I usually get a rock and roll question. I'm surprised. <laughs> So a quick question, uh, you talked about the importance of face-to-face -face meetings, and I was just curious, and I know it's individual to each CEO, each company, but how, how often would you like to see your relationship manager, and let's say their manager, when they come out to visit you? And you talked about some ideas when they come out of sharing ideas from other clients, but what's your expectation in those meetings for that to be a successful process? Um, I usually, and, and there's not a right answer here as to how often, but um, I would say, um, you know, twice a year is probably a good number. Uh, you don't want to come out too often because i got a business to run, and it sometimes can be a challenge, if, in particular right now. This is a, I'm so glad that I'm here today because for the last 30 days, I've been operating on 12 to 18 hour days, and this is just kind of a, a break to recharge my batteries. We're drinking water from a fire hose right now as we add the hundreds of customers. This never happens in a lifetime. So if a banker called me today, this would be the wrong time. But, you know, a few times a year to come out, and maybe once it's coming out and seeing the facility that we have and seeing the new equipment that we're installing and some of the new business ventures that we're getting involved in. Uh, we've actually been very busy. I acquired a company in the beginning of December and a company at the end of December, and then this this large uh, acquisition that happened in January. Very, very unusual time. Um, Monica and I play golf once a year. She doesn't come out. We just, it's a chance for me to get away from my business and the monotony of the day and just talk about what's going on in her life and my life and you know something? There, there's no strings attached. There's no expectations in that meeting. But she knows a whole lot more about my business and she doesn't thank me today. Does that answer your question? Very helpful. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, the rock and roll band you enjoy the most. <laughs> they asked me that in Atlanta. Um, I like Huey Lewis uh, because uh, I, you know, most of the, the, the talent I didn't have a lot in common with. Uh, Huey was a guy who spent 17 years trying to make it in the business before he had his first hit. So he was humble and he would stay until every fan had a signature. And he spent some time with his audience and he was somebody that I uh, related to. I didn't relate to a lot of the bands, but I like the business. It's very interesting. Uh, you know, there wasn't inventories, but um, they were businesses. And you had a profit and loss, and you had um, issues with personnel. We had a lot more issues in the rock and roll business with personnel. <laughs> but um, I tell you what, I'm a better CEO today having had that seven year experience in the rock and roll business. I had some very difficult decisions to make. It was, I was learning very fast, and I was pretty young at the time, so uh, the, the things that I learned doing that helped me down the road. How'd you get your break in that business? My cousin was um, a Wharton graduate and took a year off while he was in school to tour with a new band called the Rolling Stones. They had hit the States, and they needed a tour account because the, the money was so lucrative. The first time ever, they were the first band to take an accountant on the road with them. Mm -hmm. So his break is really what helped us. And you know, the, the future, once you're in the business, and it's really who you know in the business, uh, then the opportunities just, they flow in. I mean, we, we turned away a lot of business because there was two of us, we hired two more people, and um, it was all we could do. We were, I, there were times that I had three bands on the road, and we were all on the road. Still in the business? Much less today. He stayed in the business a lot longer than I did. I don't know if he 
is glad that he did that. Uh, it was a good business for him, but um, it's a business that's very difficult to sustain a family. And I learned that when I traveled. It was one of the reasons. I remember the day I decided to leave the business. I was actually um, traveling with Journey, and I was in Phoenix, Arizona. And each night, what I would do is I would settle up with the band. So the band manager and I would sit down, and we had half a million dollars to split up between us. And the manager would leave ten to $20,000 in my column each night. He wasn't interested in the business. He was interested in other pursuits. And I looked at this guy, and I wasn't into the debauchery of the road, and I said, if I stay in this business, am I looking at myself 20 or 30 years from now? It was really a profound experience, and I came home after the tour, and I quit the business. Anybody else? Thank you for your time.